So two mathematicians at the University of Illinois, Oppel and Hocken, in 1977 announced the proof of the four color theorem. Do you know where this proof appeared first? The Illinois Journal of Mathematics. Now, that to some taste is a little bit inbreeding. Um, by the way, there is no such thing as a Georgia Tech Journal of Mathematics, but if there were, I wouldn't publish in it. Uh -uh. Anyway, this paper appeared with an announcement in the Illinois Journal of Mathematics that the four color theorem had been proven by two mathematicians on the faculty of the University of Illinois. And the proof remains controversial because of, well, a number of factors. First, they claimed that in order to prove the four color theorem, there is a finite set of cases that need to be checked. They couldn't say how many cases. They just said it's finite. And it's huge. And then they said, we have a computer here which has checked all these cases, and they all work. They were pressed for details. And after a year or so, they began to produce computer programs and some written notes. And a couple of years later, they published a book. And you can check it out. It's in the library. It's that thick. That's supposed to be the proof. I think my statement at the bottom of this slide is intellectually and uh, ethically honest. Some researchers have never been convinced that the reduction to the finite number of cases that Oppel and Hocken produced is actually compelling and is complete and correct. And also, no one has ever been able to exhaustively run their computer code and be convinced that it works. So let's just talk about proofs, cases, and the length of arguments. In a course like 3012, we do proofs quite regularly. How long was the proof? that the maximum number of edges in a planar graph on n vertices is 3n minus 6. We fit it on one PowerPoint slide. If you look in the text, there are some proofs which go a little bit longer than that, maybe two slides. We've already referenced in this course the proof of the strong perfect graph conjecture, which went more than 200 pages in a journal. I have a number of proofs which run 30, 40, 50, 60 pages. And hardly any theorem proven in a serious research math journal is less than a couple of pages. If they're shorter than that, they're just too easy to be considered as research. But here is a principle. When a mathematician or a computer scientist or an engineer publishes a mathematical theorem, the general feeling in the community is that somebody should be able to read this proof line by line by line, and at the end of the proof say, yes, that's correct, and that proves what has been claimed. <laughs> Now, when does that get to be gray? Have you heard of the problem called uh, Fermat's last theorem? Fermat 
wrote in the notes, in the margin of his own research book, that he had found a short proof that there were no solutions to x to the n plus y to the n equals z to the n, when n was at least 3. But there wasn't enough space in the margin to write down the proof. And then Fermat died. This notebook, which was a copy of Euclid's elements, was discovered by his junior assistants. And they thought this note was really cute and assumed that Fermat indeed had a proof. But after 100 years or so, the general thinking was that Fermat did not have a proof. And serious mathematicians began to look at this problem. And about 15 years ago, a very, very capable mathematician at Princeton named Andrew Wiles announced that he had a proof. He had been working on it for 10 years. And let me emphasize, Andrew Wiles is not a crackpot. He's a really serious and brilliant mathematician who, who was taking a very risky approach because he was putting all of his career effort into proving the Fermat conjecture. So now he announced the proof. And he began to circulate a manuscript, which I understand was like 80 pages. And after six months, a mathematician at Berkeley named Ken Ribbett wrote him and said, there is a f hole in your proof. I wonder if he mailed that proof to, to himself. Uh, I, no, he, he, he wouldn't do that. Wiles looked at the statement from Ribbit, went into the proof, and realized that, yes, he was correct, that there was a hole. Wiles then worked for two more years and fixed the hole with a, a very, very elegant and a new construction, etc., and the manuscript grew from 80 pages to 120 pages. To the best of my knowledge, there are only eight people in the world who have read that full manuscript. And they confirm that Wiles did indeed solve the Fermat conjecture. It's not 80 people who have read it. It's not 800. It's not 8,000. It's like eight. But the point is that the proof has been checked line by line by line by some very reputable people, and they confirm that it's correct. That has not happened with the four-color theorem. And it will not happen. Once again, it probably will not happen in my lifetime. I don't, you, you're pretty young. It, it might happen in yours. But there's good news. In 1996, a four-member team, Robertson, Sanders, Seymour, and Thomas, you might recognize three of those names. Robertson, Seymour, and Thomas. I'll say more about Sanders in a minute. In 1996, they gave a definitive proof of the four color theorem, which is still computer based. They make their programs available on the web. You can check them out, you can read the source code. You can run them yourselves on decent computer. You don't need a supercomputer. And the correctness of their approach has been verified by many people. Now, what are they doing different than Apple and Haken? They are doing something similar 
but they're not doing exactly the same thing. So the four color theorem is indeed a theorem. And there have been additional proofs since the 1996 result. But all proofs use computers. All proofs cannot be verified by humans reading the argument line by line by line. So if you would like to become famous, if you would like to get an A++, triple credit, and you don't want to settle P equals NP, if you want to save that million bucks for another day, find a proof of the four color theorem that can indeed be read by a human, even if only eight of them, and have them say at the end of the day, yes, I've checked it line by line by line, and it's correct. Actually, I don't recommend that you do that. I think you should continue to study and pursue an undergraduate education at Georgia Tech. Uh, that's probably a much better investment of your time and energy than trying to prove the four color theorem because lots and lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of clever people tried very, very hard there are examples of fathers and sons who were very capable mathematicians who devoted their lives to it. And they couldn't do it. So probably better for you to keep studying and working towards a degree from Georgia Tech. Isn't it a fascinating story you know, about and a hundred years from now, what will historians, mathematical historians say, who proved the four color theorem? How will they tell that story? Will they say Oppel and Hocken did it? Or will they say Oppel and Hocken had an idea? They didn't drive it through, but the basic idea was headed in the right direction. I don't know. I don't know. I, I'm kind of curious. I'd like to come back in 100 years and see how history comes down.